to the Illinois principals for uh, hosting this. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eric Calvert. Uh, I'm part of the Center for Talent Development at Northwestern University. We are a comprehensive gifted education center uh, embedded within Northwestern School of Education and Social Policy. Um, I mainly work with our um, online and summer programs as well as uh, professional development um, uh, programs with schools. Um, our online programs at CTD um, in a typical year uh, usually serve somewhere between 12 and 1500 students around the world. That's a combination of students coming from individual families as well as students coming from schools that we partner with um, to help extend the options that they can provide to uh, online students. So um, I wanted to use this opportunity to share share um, a few lessons learned um, and some things that we're thinking about um, as we uh, work with schools to help them um, adjust to this new world where we're all trying to move online. And immediately my screen has frozen. Okay, so to uh, start us out with a few uh, focus questions um, and kind of help give an overview of where we're going today. Uh, first of all, um, Kind of reflect uh, amongst yourselves or uh, for your own self on the kinds of pre-assessments uh, that you are already aware of that can be done online uh, that are informative to good instruction. Um, and then the second question and one that will be the primary focus uh, for our session this afternoon is how can we best engage um, particularly our advanced learners but all students um, under the current circumstances where uh, not only um, are we uh, trying to help students, you know, kind of master the knowledge and skills that we would normally teach, but also to um, adjust and be healthy and cope with, um, you know, everything that is going on with the stress of, you know, not only worrying about COVID-19, but also being physically separated um, from friends and, and sources of support. Um, so, We'll kind of start by thinking about pre-assessment, but in the environment that we're working in, uh, we're going to pivot from looking at pre-assessment um, from the perspective of focusing primarily on what content do students already know um, to using pre-assessment to uh, figure out how best to keep our students engaged, particularly while they're um, at home and away from us in a higher stress uh, situation um, than they're they're normally in. Hey, Eric, um, Arlen, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Have you have you advanced have you advanced from the first slide? We're still seeing the first slide on our screen. Okay, it's advancing for me. Um, if I do it in this view, are you able to see no. me move around? Okay. Let's see. You might um, want to try stop sharing and then resharing your screen again. Okay. Give me just one second. Okay, we see the PowerPoint. See okay, if I advance now, can you see it? Yes, now you're good. Awesome, thanks for that feedback. Sorry okay. about that. Sorry. Um, okay, well, I hope you're all good auditory learners. <laughs> so, um, so we'll just kind of pick up where we left off. So um, it, under normal circumstances, kind of the three key elements of pre-assessment we'd be looking at are uh, readiness, interest and learning profile. Um, and typically when we think about pre-assessment related to um, education, we focus a lot about we focus a lot on readiness because we're primarily interested in um, what do students already know that we might be able to compact um, and um, in what areas might students need some pre-teaching or supplemental teaching um, as we move through a unit to help them grapple with that content successfully. Um, but today we're going to focus primarily on um, how to uh, use online tools to um, understand and leverage student interests um, and how do we use um, online tools to do some profiling of students to help us do that um, as efficiently and effectively as possible um, as we're working with them in an online environment. 
Um, so just a few examples that um, Randy and Susan put together to share. Uh, and these are you know, very simple, very quick things that you can do uh, to pre-assess uh, readiness. You, know, you don't always have to use you know, a, a pre-designed CAN instrument. Uh, some things can be uh, open-ended pre-assessment, and that's great because it provides both uh, insights into what students already know, but um, also calls on them to do um, some active thinking, you know, to kind of pull uh, into their conscious minds um, things from their backgrounds, things from past learning experiences that are going to be relevant and helpful um, as they try to master new content. Uh, so some simple examples uh, using a simple app like Seesaw or even, you know, um, you know, a, a post-it note app, uh, just ask students to respond to what do you know about the following topic? Um, another way that we can do some layering is to, you know, create a blog post or, you know, to put um, a piece of teacher created uh, writing online that introduces a topic, um, but also embed some things in it that are wrong um, and ask students to be uh, fact checkers for that. And that's a great way uh, to not only help um, set up their thinking, um, but also to uh, encourage critical thinking, which is always important, but it's particularly important now uh, while students are so immersed um, in media, uh, particularly about coronavirus um, itself. Um, and we know that some of that is high quality, trustworthy, reliable, actionable information, and some of that is junk. Um, and so engaging them in critical thinking about our content is good practice for them as well. Um, another great, uh, great simple um, pre-assessment is doing true-false statements. Um, and ask students to just label the you know, statements that are true and, and correct, um, or uh, to give students some of the more difficult questions um, you know, from the end of unit assessment or even the next uh, unit to kind of figure out um, who already has a lot of background knowledge um, and might need some additional material or alternative material in order to be optimally challenged and engaged. Um, and we'll talk about why um, maintaining a level of rigor, um, even though we know our students are stressed out right now and, and need a lot of support, uh, is actually you know, a beneficial and, and caring thing to do under these circumstances, kind of when we get towards the end of the presentation. Um, and you know, here's an example of one of those true or false kind of assessments that uh, many assessments that Randy put together. You know, and again, you can use you know any learning management system to make this you know a self-scoring uh, assessment. Um, but it's so short that even if you're reviewing you know answers manually, uh, you can do this in a minimal amount of time. But as I mentioned um, a moment ago, what we really want to focus on today um, is thinking about pre-assessment and other ways of learning about our students from the perspective of not just increasing their understanding of our content, but increasing our understanding of what they want to know. Um, what is likely to be engaging to them. Um, and that's really important because, um, you know, unlike in our regular brick and mortar classrooms where we can exert a lot of control over the environment, you know, we can place students wherever we want, we can close the door, we can turn the lights on or off, you know, we can play soft music, we can have students put headphones on, we can have students clear their desks, you know, there's a lot that we can do externally uh, to support their attention. But when we're trying to work with students at home, we don't have that control of their environments, you know, and we know that many of our students are trying to learn at the same time while they have, you know, uh, little siblings in the where you know mom or dad might be on a call for their work because they're working remotely in the next room where you know the dog or the cat might be running around um, and where there's a lot of other things that you know students can choose to do that are available to them while they're at home um, that aren't available when they're in school um, also um, you know we know particularly some of our gifted and advanced students are highly motivated by things like earning good grades um, or getting good test scores. Um, but right now, um, many schools have suspended grading or have gone to kind of no fault grading. So a student who improves their grade, you know, can get that 
that higher grade that students whose grades decline uh, are going to have another opportunity. Um, so if students are super motivated by grades, then that kind of removes that pressure. So we need to find ways to better leverage those intrinsic sources of motivation while we're under this kind of unique circumstances. Uh, and then finally, this stuff is really important because we have all of the same stuff going on. Um, you know, we're also home with little siblings or children uh, or, or pets and lots of things on, on our minds as well. Um, and so some of these things that we'll talk about are really about building um, stronger teacher-student relationships and stronger peer-to-peer -peer relationships that we can all lean on to help us through this really difficult circumstance that we're all living through. Um, so, um, I always, this is, you know, I kind of keep a notebook um, when I work directly with students of uh, just funny things that they say. I know a lot of other teachers do this too, but um, a few years ago I was teaching kind of a mini course on um, psychology and uh, particularly kind of psychology for talent development um, to a group of middle school students. And so um, I was trying to tailor uh, this content to be as relevant as possible to things that I know are important to adolescents. And one thing, because these were middle school students, and one thing that we know um, is really important to adolescents is one kind of knowing if what they're thinking or feeling is, you know, quote unquote, normal. Um, and second, they are super interested in what other people are doing and what other people think about them. Um, and so some of the concepts we were exploring, you know, we would uh, kind of share with them, you know, examples of these different psychological assessments. Um, and we happen to share as an example, um, um, the, I think it was the Myers-Briggs type indicator. It's a, a personality assessment instrument. Um, and we were having kind of a debate over whether or not it was, you know, a valid and reliable uh, instrument, which is kind of interesting to talk about uh, with middle school uh, students, but they got to kind of take a version of it, to, you know, for the purpose of understanding what it was like. Um, but because it was giving them information about themselves, they were super engaged with it. Um, and they, I had a really hard time actually getting them off that topic to be able to move uh, to the next topic that day. And when I came in the next morning and kind of introduced my lesson plan for the day, uh, a, a student, you know, exclaimed with uh, great frustration, like, Dr. Calvert, will we get to take any tests today? Um, and they didn't mean, are we going to take, you know, any tests that you're going to grade? Um, but are you going to do anything today that is going to help me learn about me? Um, and that was a really powerful lesson for me and a lot of kind of how I think about pedagogy now, particularly for that age group, it's kind of driven by that realization. So um, I want to share a few examples of ways that we can kind of pre-assess inter uh, interest in a normal, um, kind of a normal classroom situation, and then uh, highlight a few things from um, online sites and services that are super popular and super engaging uh, for um, children and teens to kind of see what we can extract from that um, to engage interest. But, you know, a great way to assess interest um, is simply to give students choices and then see how they react. Um, that can be done through a simple Google form, um, you know, a Quizlet where you can kind of gamify it a little bit, uh, or even something as simple as sending students an email or, um, you know, a text message if your school has a secure platform for that uh, with a question um, and just ask for that response and engage conversationally around it. It doesn't always have to be something that is super formal. Um, one example that you know, Randy shared is to rank order the person you'd like to compare and contrast to yourself uh, during a study of famous people um, and to do that through Seesaw or a, or a Google form. Um, and I'm going to kind of accelerate through this a little bit since we got a little bit of a slow start. Um, but I'd like to ask you to just pause for just a second and I'll be quiet for just a moment to let you reflect on that. Um, but thinking about either computer use in your regular classroom or if you have um, children at home uh, or children in your life that you know outside of school, think for a minute about you know, what happens if you hand them a Chromebook or a tablet 
or a phone and let them go anywhere they want or let them do anything they want to do, um, what do they do? So, and, and I'll talk a little bit about kind of what national data tells us about what they do and, and where they choose to go um, here in just a moment. But one thing that I wanted to highlight to you, because I know that this has been a big concern um, in a lot of the conversations that we've been a part of about um, how much should we even try to do online because of concerns about equity. Um, and I wanted to share some real statistics for you. Um, and this is from um, the Pew Trust that's been doing a longitudinal study on um, internet on internet usage in the lives of children and teens for more than a decade now. Um, and they look at a lot of really interesting trends. Um, and if this is something that's interesting to you, I really suggest that you go um, and Google um, and, and, and read about this. There's some really great stuff out there. But I wanted to point out um, just a handful of things on screen. And one is that um, among all uh, US adolescents and teens, 95% um, um, do say that they have access um, at home um, to a smartphone. And when we look farther down um, at how that breaks out by family income, it's really surprising to a lot of people to see how small uh, the gaps in access really are between low-income families and non-low-income families. Um, it's you know approaching 95% um, across the board that at least have access to smartphones. So um, when we think about making online learning accessible, um, one thing that we really encourage is thinking about um, access um, on a mobile device first, because where we still do see um, a digital divide um, is among, um, is, is with respect to access to a desktop or laptop computer. And even there, we see that the majority of low income students do have access to a desktop or laptop computer at home, but there remains a pretty significant divide there um, by income. Um, the last thing that I wanted to point out, because this relates to something that we'll explore a little bit later, is that when we look at um, device access by um, both income and family income level, um, we see remarkably high levels of access to gaming consoles, even among um, low income students and even among uh, families that um, have parents that don't have a college degree. In fact, um, um, it's actually higher, you know, in, in the low income group than it is the high income group. And that really speaks to how compelling uh, games can be uh, for, uh, for students of, of all income levels. So next, let's look at where do um, adolescents and teens actually spend their time online when they do get the Chromebook or the iPad or um, pull out their phones, um, where do they go? Um, and far and away, um, the most popular sites are YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. Um, and YouTube and Snapchat, um, we see students using often multiple times a day. Um, and so these are extremely compelling to students. And it's interesting to step back and think about the fact that um, almost no one is getting credit for interacting with anyone else on YouTube. Um, no one is getting paid uh, to create content, or almost no one is getting paid to create content uh, for Facebook and Instagram. It's so rewarding to do it um, that we provide all of this content to these billion dollar companies for free. Um, so um, what can we learn from that as teachers? to try to make our content as engaging as possible. So that's what we're gonna dive into next. How do we maximize engagement, borrowing some design principles from these uh, sites and platforms that have been so successful um, with this age group? So let's start with Instagram. This is kind of now the number one destination for um, a lot of our students. And um, some key features of, of Instagram that differentiate it from other platforms and really kind of define it are one is that it provides um, a, an opportunity for users to express themselves visually. Um, and we know that this can be uh, compelling for uh, 
students who might struggle to create other kinds of content. Um, um, but, you know, it kind of creates an opportunity for them to curate how others perceive their world. Um, it provides an opportunity for creative expression. Um, and when we look at the actual content of um, what students this age post, you know, yes, there's a lot of kind of just what I did today kinds of things, but there's actually a, quite a bit of um, composition going on. There's a lot of kind of meta thinking going on, you know, students are, you know, deliberately kind of creating these expressions of themselves. Um, another element of Instagram that makes it really sticky is that it's a little bit competitive. Um, you know, students um, or, you know, users want to know that other people um, are viewing and appreciating uh, their content. So that feedback uh, is really a big part of the reward, even though we're not giving students, you know, credit for, for doing it. Um, another piece that sometimes we forget is really compelling to students is that um, we all want to know what our peers are doing. You know, we want to know what's normal. Um, in some of the research literature on this area, they refer to this um, behavior as social surveillance, which I know sounds kind of creepy, but um, in this instance, we don't necessarily mean it as like we're stalking, you know, with malicious intent anyone. It's that um, this is how um, we learn, you know, before the first day of school, um, how our friends are going to dress this year. Uh, this is how we learn um, what topics, um, you know, girls or boys we like are, uh, are interested in that will, you know, help us engage with them. You know, we're using this content uh, to help us navigate the world socially. Um, and that's a very normal behavior, particularly for students this age. Um, and then the last piece that makes Instagram so compelling uh, to students is that there's an algorithm behind it. Um, and we're not all seeing the same content as we use it. It's learning um, what is engaging to us, um, who we like to be with, and then what we see, the more we use it, is more differentiated um, for us. So if we were to apply some of those design principles in education, um, how, we, how might we kind of translate some of that? Um, well, one, you know, if you are kind of familiar with the universal design for learning framework. Uh, there's kind of validation in this for that idea that um, we can increase engagement and success by providing students with multiple means of engaging um, around um, a topic. Um, and in this case, that means using different forms of media in addition to uh, text and speech, which are usually kind of our default modes of communicating with students when we're in a classroom, even though we know that that's not, you know, the, the strongest modality for some of our students. Um, I think the second takeaway is that, um, you know, while a lot of us are focused on, you know, getting our quote unquote content online, uh, we need to approach that in a way that is not a one-way street. So what we're trying to do now is to not recreate, you know, or, or model our content uh, based on how would a textbook be organized and how would, you know, uh, what kind of language would a textbook use, um, but um, how do we frame this in a way that um, students perceive that content as something that they can engage in conversation around um, and how can they use media uh, to react to it. Um, we would also uh, kind of take away from this that reactions to things that students create motivate their continuing contributions. Um, so even the knowledge that someone has looked at what we've shared increases the likelihood that we will create and share more. Um, second, uh, similarly, seeing others' work um, can be super motivating to us. Um, and kind of one of the nice things about incorporating some of these concepts into um, a teacher facilitated space is that it creates an opportunity for curation. So when we think about increasing rigor, for example, one um, uh, kind of aha moment that I've had that, that I've used is that 
whoever makes the first post in an online discussion um, or you know uploads their assignment first um, is often setting a standard uh, for other students. Um, and many students will actually wait to see what others have posted uh, as kind of a, um, a verification step that how they're perceiving the assignment um, is appropriate. But um, we can actually leverage that from an educator perspective and say, okay, so I've now seen 10 assignments come in and none of those are visible uh, you know, to other students, but I can kind of take um, the two or three um, strongest pieces of student work um, and you know, with those students' permission, share excerpts of that work um, to create authentic models for other students to follow. Um, and when I've done this, um, even with graduate students where you know, I've taught the same section, but over time, if I can take some examples of the strongest student work from the previous section um, and share that as kind of non-judged example work, uh, for current students, all of my students in the new section will work up to that standard without me having to be the heavy um, and saying, I know you can do better or, or push harder. Like They will simply kind of do their own holistic assessment with that work and work to that standard. Um, and then finally, prioritizing interest-based differentiation, especially in schools where students are held harmless on grading right now uh, during school building closures uh, is really, I think, the, the strongest way to go. The, the more we can capitalize on students' interests, the more engaged they're gonna be. Um, and the fact that students aren't being held accountable to the extent they, they normally would be also gives us permission to not worry so much about being comprehensive in our coverage of standards, but to allow opportunities for students to really double down on those topics that are high interest, high passion for them, um, where we can kind of leverage those innate interests. Um, let's look next at the one that students are increasingly spending more and more time on, uh, which is YouTube. Now the uh, average um, adolescent now spends more than an hour a day uh, watching YouTube videos. And I know a lot of people are uh, kind of shocked and, and think that this is a really terrible thing. Um, and to a certain extent, you know, I would rather than read books, but if there's one piece of good news uh, that can let you rest well uh, at, at night tonight um, is that most of the, the time that students are spending watching YouTube is taking away from the time that previous generations would have spent watching television. Um, so maybe it's a good thing um, because there are actually some features of this that uh, we can kind of consider advancements from traditional um, television. Um, one, unlike broadcast TV, viewers and creators interact with one another. Um, and that's important because not only does it feel, make viewers feel more connected to creators, but it also motivates creators to create more because they feel like they're serving a community of people who share their interests. Um, second, unlike television, um, YouTube videos are not either 24 minutes or 22 minutes leaving room for eight minutes of commercials or 48 minutes leaving room for 12 minutes of commercials. Uh, YouTube videos are as long as the, the content warrants. So if there's only 30 seconds worth of something to say, that's how long they are. Um, but if there's more depth to explore, they can be longer if they're not trying to prefit any form. Um, we also know that many students create and share their own content um, on these platforms. Um, there's um, uh, some great writing um, out there um, that kind of looks at what students do um, on their own time. Um, there's some great examples of um, a community in Brazil, a, a community of teens in Brazil that was super interested in um, Japanese anime and manga. Um, and they took it upon themselves to translate um, these uh, Japanese animated films that hadn't been translated um, into Portuguese um, and to upload those to YouTube and subtitle them to make that content that they were passionate about uh, more accessible uh, to their, their peers. 
Um, and again, you know, that shows a great investment of effort, a great investment um, of learning time um, with no external reward other than uh, the respect and gratitude of their community. And then the last thing that students really seem to love about YouTube um, is the ability to pause, go back, replay, um, vary the playback speed of, um, and view closed captioning um, of videos. And that has made it an extremely popular platform for informal learning. Um, and we know that one thing that many students are doing in that hour plus a day that they're spending on YouTube um, is going there uh, to see uh, examples and demos of things that relate to their academic goals or their learning goals. Um, and, you know, a lot of people use YouTube to, to learn a new skill. Um, you know, for example, you know, I'm not the most mechanically oriented person in the world, but um, you know, by watching YouTube videos, I've you know had the confidence to you know rebuild a robot vacuum and you know replace the hard drive in my computer. You know, uh, one of my colleagues um, has a son that that got into uh, cycling, but you know didn't have the resources to buy um, a top-notch bike, so bought kind of a used junker and then uh, watched YouTube videos to learn how to repair it and restore it. And that's a really common behavior too. So what can we take away from that? That as educators. Uh, well, one, you know, I think it underscores the power of using multiple kinds of media in delivering academic content. That's not to say that we want to replace reading, because uh, of course that's super valuable too, but um, we also know that um, seeing and hearing can be a great complement um, to reading. Um, the second thing that I would call out as you know, an aha moment from the, you know, kind of the inherent design of YouTube is that just like YouTube didn't feel compelled to require that all videos be a certain length, um, we should be careful too to not um, unmindfully just try to translate structures that work in a brick and mortar classroom, you know, into online. So if our class periods are 40 minutes a day at school, that doesn't mean that our online lessons should be 40 minutes a day or, or you know, or 40 minutes at a time. And in fact, I would argue that they probably shouldn't be um, because if we look at you know, the videos that students engage with most on YouTube, uh, most of those are actually considerably shorter. Um, so don't, don't think about trying to replicate the traditional lecture, uh, but thinking about providing uh, that content in the bite sizes that are appropriate, whether or not that's 30 seconds at a time or 15 minutes at a time. Another thing that we've learned from uh, looking at analytics from um, some of these um, online services is confirmation that students' attention spans are not fixed traits. Um, when we talk about things like attention deficit disorders in school, and, and, and that's you know, a real legitimate thing, but there's kind of this assumption that um, attention span is something that we have in a fixed amount, like you know, height. Um, but in reality, students' attention spans and actually adults' attention spans um, aren't fixed. Um, they vary quite a bit uh, based on level of interest in the content. So if I'm really, really interested in, you know, repairing my online robot, you know, I can watch that same video several times or I can watch two or three hours of, uh, of content related to that and not get bored and not tune out. Um, but if I go to another topic that I'm not interested in, um, I might zone out after 30 seconds of that content. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to point out is that many students have figured out intuitively that a great way to learn from video is to uh, pause it and kind of go one step at a time um, or rewind and rewatch the part that we need to see again. But that's not obvious to all students. Um, so the first time that you teach using a video, um, that's a great thing to call out to students to make sure that they're aware of that learning affordance of using um, online video in an online video player. Um, the next one that I want to talk about, and this one is probably the one that um, adults fear the most, um, and I probably do too when I think about like my nieces and nephews, but um, Snapchat. Um, this is where um, students are spending 
um, a tremendous amount of time um, and things that they really love about Snapchat. And this is one where there does seem to be a pretty significant generational divide. Um, adolescents and teenagers love it and there are a few adults there and those two things might actually be correlated. Um, but one thing that teens say they really, really love about Snapchat is that they perceive it, believe it or not, as being more private than other social networking tools. Um, so these students actually are pretty savvy about who can see the things that they share. Now, their perceptions might not always be accurate, um, but at least they're attuned to the reality that there are good audiences and bad, and bad audiences. Um, compared to other popular social platforms like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, etc., cetera, um, one thing that distinguishes Snapchat is that most interaction on Snapchat is between very small groups, either two people um, or a small group of closer friends versus uh, something that you're posting to your profile that your mom can see, your friends can see, you know, your, you know, whoever, um, whoever can see. Students perceive it at least as being a more intimate platform um, and therefore they feel freer uh, to kind of be who they are um, and even to express opinions or interests that they're that they don't perceive as being popular um, and for particularly kind of our uh, gifted and advanced students that are um, a little bit on that kind of geeky nerdy spectrum uh, that's a really appealing feature um, a second thing that is really engaging about this platform for students is um, ephemerality, the fact that um, Snapchat content disappears um, and that helps students feel like it's okay to take risks. Now in reality, you know, we know that people can do screen captures and, and nothing ever really goes away from the internet or at least we, we should assume that it doesn't, but, but that's the perception. Um, so kind of when we think about that through an educational lens, then um, kind of one thing that I think is encouraging and that some people that are a little bit skeptical about online learning maybe should take some assurance from is the fact that even though almost all users of Snapchat are also users of Facebook and Instagram, um, that you know, even when they have access to a platform where they can, in theory, interact with the whole wide world, they are still perceiving unique value in opportunities to have one-on-one -on -one and small group conversations. Um, so um, we are not raising um, a generation of nihilists, you know, as much as, you know, we fear that's the case, you know, in reality, they do value those personal deep connections. Um, and second, um, students, and again, this is especially true of kind of upper elementary, adolescent, early high school age students, they think about and care about um, who sees uh, what they create, um, and they're really thoughtful um, about it in most cases, um, but some may be more likely to engage online and take positive risks too. Um, if we can provide them some opportunities to do that in a forum where they have some control of the audience. So um, I would encourage teachers to think about doing some things, particularly where we're asking students to go further out in their comfort zone or engage with content that we know is relatively advanced for them to give them their first opportunities for collaboration and interaction within smaller groups and ideally smaller groups where they have some degree of choice um, in choosing their partners because then we're baking in a certain comfort level uh, with that content. And we know that those students, particularly those that are more introverted or more risk averse, are more likely to stick their necks out if they know that the stakes are a little bit lower because a smaller group of people are gonna be able to see that content. So I hope that makes sense. Um, and then lastly, um, I'll touch on Facebook because this is kind of the original and still um, the biggest 
platform, even though it's not necessarily the one where um, students are now spending the most time, it is the one that most students um, at least have accounts on. Um, and that's also true of adults. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about some things that are design features and then some things that are evolved or emergent features of Facebook. Um, and the first emergent, face, uh, emergent feature of Facebook that's really important to its success today is that um, even though it has this reputation among um, students as now being the uncool platform, the reality is they're all on it and so is everybody else. Um, and it feels really socially expensive to leave. Um, a lot of people from time to time have had the idea that, you know what, I'm tired of seeing all this like political negativity or I'm tired of X or I'm tired of Y, I'm going to leave Facebook. And a lot of people wind up coming back. Um, and that's because it's not that they're loyal to Facebook, it's the fact that they're loyal to their friends and family and they're all there. Um, so that kind of makes it really, really difficult for these other platforms to overtake. Um, the other thing that um, users really seem to um, love about this platform is that we can interact with the people that we like and care about 24 hours a day, seven days a week, whether they're actually online or not. It gives us this opportunity to time shift um, our social interaction. So even people that we might not be able to have a real time conversation with, um, we can feel connected to uh, because we can um, post and share things, you know, not in the same time. Um, and this helps create that feeling that our friends are accessible to us even when they're not. Um, it kind of creates this kind of sense of closeness among the people that we're connected to, because even though they might not be sharing a photo specifically with us, you know, the fact that, you know, people don't just know my work as a professional, but they know that I have the same kind of dog that they do, or that I like the same kind of movie they do, it makes them feel closer to me uh, and kind of, you know, strengthens those these perceptions of, of social ties. Um, another aspect, and this is one that I would really like to cue in on, is that um, Facebook was really the pioneer in using what um, BJ Fogg calls hot triggers, um, and that is um, kind of intentional design cues um, that are meant to motivate immediate behaviors. So um, kind of one thing that, you know, and a few years ago, there was a lot of conversation about how social media had killed blogs. Um, and kind of the main takeaway from that is that um, one thing that the social media platforms introduced to the mix is making it really easy for content creators to know that people are viewing and, and interacting with their content. Um, and they were, thoughtful about trying to create habit um, among their user base to make people come back to this um, every day. Um, and that's really been a big part of, of why, you know, Facebook has had such strong gravity, uh, even though, um, you know, it gets a lot of negative press. But if you think about what happens, you know, if you're a Facebook user, um, if somebody posts a photo of you and tags you in that photo, um, you know, obviously, if you happen to be on Facebook at the moment they do that, you'll know about it. Um, but Facebook doesn't really care if you're there or not. If you're not online, you're going to get an email notification about it. If you've got the app installed on your phone, which if you use Facebook, you almost certainly do, you're going to get a notification about it. Um, you know, uh, Facebook versus a lot of other corporate entities at the time uh, was intentional about not protecting uh, their brand or logo. They want movie producers and game designers and, you know, anything that sells anything to use their Facebook logo. Um, and what they're really trying to do there is to give everybody cues, even when they're not in Facebook, to come back to Facebook um, and interact. And when we think about um, increasing engagement in our online course spaces. Um, you know, one thing that a lot of people are just concerned about is like, well, we put all this content out there, um, but, you know, students don't seem to log on. Um, well, if that's the case, 
you know, don't mope about it, you know, be like Facebook and go out and get them. Um, you know, be thoughtful about trying to enculture that habit. And, you know, when you post new content, then if your online learning management system doesn't automatically send an email or a notification, do that. Um, or if you have um, a text messaging platform that you're allowed to use for school, um, like say Google Voice, uh, use that. Actively reach out into the student's world, meet them where they are, and invite them back in um, to that space. And the best way to do that um, is to communicate the idea that um, other students are engaged around something. Um, and if you're not here, you're missing out. Um, or, you know, other students are engaging around something that is of high interest to you. Um, you know, this would be a great time for you to come back and get engaged in that. So it's not passive, um, you know, for better or worse. Um, it's been really aggressive about bringing itself, you know, into our life outside of what we think of as our dedicated screen time. And then the last feature I wanted to point out about uh, Facebook that was really innovative at the time and has been widely copied um, is that. Um, the designers of Facebook were really intentional about one, making it really easy uh, for people that are viewing content to provide quick feed, quick immediate feedback um, to the people that posted it. So that's what that like button was originally um, all about, um, in addition to kind of helping create profiles. Um, but then the other piece that made Facebook really appealing versus the kind of wide open web and you know you might have a local newspaper that you know at the bottom of the story you can leave comments um, and you you know if you ever read those it almost doesn't matter what newspaper it is um, people are just terrible to one another in those spaces um, because it's anonymous and they're not accountable um, but Facebook did two things that really made people feel a lot more comfortable about interacting online. One is that they made it so that the default feedback, the easiest form of feedback to provide was positive. If you think about it, there's a like button, there is no dislike button. Um, so it's easy to leave positive feedback for somebody, but if you want to be a jerk, you can, but you've got to invest some effort into it. You know, you've got to actually write something uh, in order to be that. So uh, it kind of creates a sort of a social physics that is more likely to be positive than to not. Um, and so we want to come back and engage with it. Um, uh, and then secondly, um, it's actually the kind of that sacrifice of privacy that Facebook is leaning on um, to make sure that users um, behave themselves in interacting with one another because the rules of social accountability apply. I'm not anonymous. Um, you know who I am and I know who you are. Um, so translating that into an educational environment, a really powerful strategy for making students feel connected to us as educators um, is to thoughtfully self-disclose um, appropriate personal information. Um, because when I tell you, know, if you and I were to meet physically in a hallway, hopefully in a future world where nobody is infectious, um, and I say, hi, you know, my name's Eric Calvert. Um, I work at Northwestern University. Um, you know, my favorite food is tacos and my favorite show is this. Um, if we haven't met before, um, you know, you're going, most likely you're going to respond to that by telling me who you are, where you work, what kind of food you like, and what your favorite show is. Um, and so, you know, it's not always, you know, asking questions, but, but sharing things. Um, and this turns out to be a great way for uh, us to create opportunities for students to find things that we have in common and feel connected. And I think this can have a particularly powerful effect when superficially it doesn't seem like we as teachers have a lot in common um, with some of our students, particularly if we work with a lot of students who are from a different um, cultural background or you know, grew up in different life circumstances than we have or come from a different place. Uh, you know, it's the sharing of these things that, that we like and do and, and worry about that create you know, more and more opportunities for people to find points of connection. So on some macro level things, we might not have a lot in common, but if we can discover that, oh, you know, we both really like 
you know, the show Parks and Recreation, you know, that's something that we can talk about and build a relationship or at least start a relationship around. Um, so think about as you're presenting um, yourself as an educator online um, to your students, not copying kind of the writing voice of, you know, a textbook or a formal syllabus, um, but using, particularly in those like discussion spaces and like some of the kind of informal video content that you create, a lot of I messages, I think this, I worry about this, I like this, here's what I'm doing to try to, you know, bring some order around my day uh, that is really gonna help students feel connected, even though in reality, uh, you might not be having a lot of really true kind of one-on-one -on -one con connection with them uh, while they're learning online. So that's a lot of information. What does, it, what does any of it have to do with rigor, um, which is why you're here today? Well, like I said, persistence is like attention, not a fixed characteristic. Um, it's situational. Um, and one thing to know is that almost all students will tolerate steeper learning curves. They'll tolerate you figuring out the technology you're going to use. Uh, and they will tolerate greater frustration without giving up when they care about the outcome. Um, and we call this commitment. Um, but one thing that we know um, from looking at you know, for example, some of the research on student reading level. Um, reading level, you know, isn't fixed, completely fixed either. Yes, there are kind of skill sets that, you know, kind of create an upward boundary. Um, but, you know, the reality is most students can deal with higher lexile content than we might expect if they're really interested in that material. And second, if they have some background knowledge or experience that helps them infer meaning of new vocabulary. So, you know, you know, if you think about trying to read a sign in a foreign country, um, you know, you might not know all of the verbs and, and, and the different de derivations of those verbs. But if you know a handful of core nouns, you can often figure out the basic meaning of that. And the same is true uh, of higher level content, you know, in our own native languages. So, um, you know, this is really, I think, the time to leverage individual interests as much as possible. Um, and then lastly, um, we'll invest more effort to meet expectations of educators um, when we respect those educators and we feel like they like us and they know us. And there's some great research um, out in the world that, that's looked at student persistence all the way up through medical school um, and, and found that when students feel like there is at least one adult involved in their education system who understands them as a person, they are very likely to drop out regardless of um, the circumstances in their life. But similarly, if they don't feel like there is an educator um, or an administrator or a guidance counselor at that school that knows them and cares about them as an individual, um, then that student is an at-risk student. Um, and so kind of leveraging those opportunities to share what we like you know, is actually a great way to build persistence um, and to build um, appetite for and tolerance for rigor. Um, so some kind of fundamental strategies we can use to add rigor, you know, obviously are accelerating the pace. This is something that a lot of teachers struggle with, you know, in a traditional classroom because you have to do classroom management for everybody at the same time. But one actually nice thing about having students learning online is that it provides opportunities for students to spend more time on the things that they need more time to master and less time on the things that they don't um, and to move at a more individualized pace. Um, and we see that a lot in our online programs that uh, we offer to give to students at Northwestern. 
the second great way to add rigor is to add complexity. That doesn't necessarily mean more work, uh, but to add another variable or two to advance students' thinking. This is a great way to differentiate um, as well. You know, you can cover the same kind of basic standard with all students, but then you know, introduce these additional variables or additional complications for your more advanced learners that kind of make them stretch a little bit. Uh, and then finally, add depth. That's creating opportunities for students to go uh, more deeply into content that is of high interest. One strategy that I really like um, to use in my own online classes there um, is to differentiate, you know, in my syllabi and in my um, online course space, um, items that are required for all students and things that are supplemental um, based on interest. Um, and I've been very pleasantly surprised to find that um, a lot of the things that I share that are supplemental or extensions or kind of side notes on things that we're working with as a class, um, that you know, even when I explicitly label those things as being supplemental, not required, et cetera, that a surprisingly high percentage of students do choose uh, to engage with some of that content. But by clearly labeling those things as required versus supplemental, then it allows students who are feeling stressed out or do need uh, to uh, prioritize other activities to um, skip over some things and come back to them later if they want uh, without feeling stressed out about the fact that my teacher posted something and I haven't read it. Um, so that's a great strategy too. Um, we touched on that a little bit already, so I will accelerate um, through acceleration. Um, this is just an example of, you know, uh, kind of a litmus test of knowing that you've crafted a truly open-ended question. Um, you know, a great way to test that out is, you know, ask yourself, um, can I Google and then copy and paste the correct answer to this? Um, and I know a lot of teachers right now are worried about academic honesty. One strategy that a lot of our online teachers use is one, ask an open-ended question um, and have that open-ended question tie to something that is individual to the student. Um, so, you know, what do you think about, um, you know, this concept in chemistry and how does that apply to um, how you would go about cooking um, your favorite food, right? So, you know, I can't probably go out and Google what my favorite food is and have that be integrated with the answer to the question. So anyway, just an example. Um, examples of, of critical thinking, uh, you know, here are some ways to kind of tie in things that are happening in the, in the you know, in the world that students are inhabiting outside of class. You know, if, when we come back to school, how can we maintain social distance in a lunchroom? Um, uh, you know, or think about places students go and, and, you know, how to connect that back to their regular lives. So um, to leave a, a little bit of time for questions, I just want to uh, kind of wrap up um, by talking about rigor today. Um, and I've seen a lot of people posting things in social media sites, kind of even critiquing the idea that we're trying to do uh, education right now when we know students are stressed out um, and away from, you know, and many students are away from the support systems that their schools normally provide. Um, and especially since we're not even giving grades right now in a lot of places. Um, but I'd like to point out that the, the level of rigor of content in terms of its intellectual uh, complexity actually has very little to do with how harshly or easily we grade it or whether or not it counts for points or not. Uh, rigor is really about um, complexity uh, and intellectual uh, richness. Then the next kind of point I'd like to call out um, is that almost because students are highly distractible now, almost because we can't regulate their environments, um, rigor is a really valuable thing um, because when we are learning something within like what Vygotsky calls like our zone of proximal development, meaning it's challenging enough 
that we that in order for us to grapple with it successfully, we have to give it our full attention. Um, when there is more rigorous content, it's um, actually sometimes easier to screen out those background noises, um, those um, those worries that are at the back of our minds, um, and we enter what um, the psychologist Mahai Csikszentmihalyi refers to as a flow state. Um, and a flow state is when you are so engaged in something that you lose track of everything else in the world, at least for a brief moment of time, um, and you lose track of time and your external worries and concerns disappear. Um, sometimes we might even forget to eat for a few hours because we're so, we're so engaged in what we're doing. Um, and people who frequently experience flow states are uh, healthier mentally, uh, they report higher levels of life satisfaction, um, and they're more creative, productive than people who don't. Um, and I think um, if there's ever been a time where um, we need help um, screening out worries that are at the back of our mind, where uh, while we're on lockdown, we need to lose track of time uh, and feel like that's going by faster. Um, it's right now, um, and rigor is a great tool uh, to help do that, um, but to introduce complex ideas, um, but low stakes, I think, is kind of the golden mean uh, for where we want to be right now. Um, so I'll stop there on uh, kind of the presentation aspect of this um, and throw it open to questions. So. Um, Harlan, do we have anything in the, the chat box? No, we've got no questions as of yet. Um, but Eric, I want to thank you for sharing all that valuable information with our participants. We had so many log in today. We really appreciate that. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, this will be recorded and sent out to everyone um, as a recording link once we wrap up here today. Um, if you do have questions, please type them into the questions box. Looks like we're getting a lot of thank yous. Great information for you, Eric. But no. Don't see any direct questions. We'll hang out here for a couple more minutes just to make sure there aren't. Oh, Todd asked, will the recording include the slides? Eric, would you be able to get me a PDF of your PowerPoint? Yes, we'll do that. Okay, Absolutely. if you send that over to me, I can make sure to share that out with all of our attendees. Okay. Um, I hear we've got a question for you, Eric. Um, what resources or websites do you suggest we use to support? um to support students learning online i suppose so yeah they kind of left it open-ended there okay um so what i would recommend is um to start out with kind of creating and whether you use google classroom we we use schoology as our learning management system at um, ctd or you know even if you just go out and create a free you know edmodo account um create some kind of space that you're going to use consistently with students as the jumping off point for the day. Um, and ideally pick something that allows you to add content um, over time. Um, and, you know, I think for these basic uh, features, um, you know, Edmodo, Schoology, you know, Google Classroom, you know, whatever your district IT department has, you know, provided as, as long as there are affordances for uh, discussion and sharing links, um, that's probably good enough. Um, and then kind of use that to bring, um, you know, resources you find from um, elsewhere into that space. So even in a lot, of, you know, in the courses that we offer at CTD, you know, obviously there's a lot of original teacher created content in there, but, you know, we also utilize a lot of third party content, but because we know that particularly younger students, even if they're very bright, you know, academically advanced students, um, they typically haven't developed a high level of executive functioning skills yet. So once they leave uh, the, course space for an external link, it's really easy for them to get lost and kind of not find their way back. And they might be very engaged with that content, but you're not going to get feedback on that. Um, as much as possible, we like to make use of tools that allow us to, um, you know, embed content within our spaces or, you know, at least post links, you know, from within that. Um, 
and then you know if we can't truly embed the content when we create those links um, to try to set those links up to where they're opening that third-party content um, in a new window so that you know class remains you know back there on our desktop um, somewhere so that you know we're going to be you know when we close that window you know where we jumped out we're going to come back to that content um, so as far as can platforms that would be kind of the main thing that I would look at and then the second piece that I would just like to reinforce as much as possible um, is um, all feedback is you know as long as it's honest is good um, but um, students need it so you know don't wait you know until you can provide you know detailed comments and a final grade on something when you know students are nervous about online learning or you know you have students that haven't mastered it yet uh, when they submit something even if you haven't you know read it yet say got it um, or you know when you know a student you know post something that's reasonably okay and you've got a like button uh, use it because it's that um, that immediate feedback that is going to kind of be the habit development part of it. Um, and then the second piece to note is that um, you don't have to be stressed about doing that every single time because intermittent reinforcement is actually more powerful for building habit uh, than continuous reinforcement. So uh, if you, as long as students are getting some feedback and you provide detailed feedback on students, you know, every third or fourth thing students provide and, you know, more, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, you know, or, you know, three popcorn bags out of five on a, you know, a video project, you know, things that you can do quickly, uh, you know, any kind of mixing and matching is fine as long as students are getting some immediate confirmation that, you know, they're on the right track, um, you know, you can breathe a, a sigh of relief um, and you're probably okay. Wonderful. Eric, Rachel asks, are there any other takeaways, particularly for significant needs students? Yeah, um, so I think um, I'll go back to you know, the YouTube example. Um, um, you know, one thing that has really helped that platform take off is the fact that, um, you know, it's easy to find, um, you know, relevant content, but uh, there's also closed captioning available. Um, you know, it's available in, you know, a lot of the content is available in, in multiple languages. So um, I, I, I think we should, while we're kind of in this moment where it's hard to get the kinds of support we would commonly provide in school to students in their homes, um, things that we can do from a universal design perspective that um, allow multiple options for exploring a concept, you know, having a reading and a video and a podcast, even if we only require that students view or read or listen to one of those, um, invites students to learn through the modality that they're most confident in uh, related to that content the good news is that um you know students who like you know need to see things graphically kind of naturally uh migrate toward that content um and do a pretty good job in, of, of kind of self-differentiating uh the other thing um that i think is encouraging about online learning for students with disabilities is that it makes it really easy to provide um, extended time and alternate forms of assessment, um, you know, versus being in a traditional classroom where one student or a small group of students doing something that's different from other students means, you know, that we have to manage two or three activities at the same time. Um, you know, that's, you know, less of an issue when we're teaching online because, you know, students are learning semi-independently and that frees up time for us to work uh, more intensively as, as teachers with individual students in small groups. Um, and we do see that, um, you know, often with our teachers uh, teaching online. And that's the case for students that have kind of formally diagnosed disabilities, but then um, also students that might be a little bit on that spectrum, but not to the degree that they've been 
you know, that they've received a clinical diagnosis. Um, and that's often the case with uh, gifted students who have a lot of strengths that sometimes allow them to kind of self-accommodate for some of the challenges that they might have. So, um, you know, seeing where students naturally gravitate can kind of give you some really useful cues to knowing what kind of content is going to be most appealing and most accessible to them. Um, but we shared some resources on our previous presentation kind of related to accessibility, and I can uh, reshare those um, when we uh, share the presentation for you to post. Wonderful. Thank you, Eric. We've got time for one more question, and then I did want to just address um, for our Illinois participants, if you're looking for PD clock hours, I will be sending out an evaluation link. Um, once this recording is ready, it may, may not be until tomorrow. Um, but I'll be sending out an evaluation link that once you complete that evaluation, you will receive the ISBE evidence of completion form via email so you can enter your PD clock hours. Um, final question for you, Eric, what do you suggest for when we return to the physical classroom space? I'm thinking we need to keep this going after the current situation. Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of my hopes is that there will be things that, you know, we you know, that, that idea that, you know, war is the mother of invention, right? That there are things that we develop to gra grapple with a crisis that turn out to be so useful that, um, you know, we want to apply those and, and reuse those um, when we come back um, into regular life. I mean, when you think about the fact that the internet itself was designed to survive a nuclear war um, and to, you know, allow, um, you know, military command and control of our arsenal. Um, and it's become, you know, this thing that, you know, we now use often in such, you know, a loving and caring way to support the development of, you know, little preschool children. Um, I'm hoping that that phenomenon will will repeat itself as, as we're all kind of learning this. But I, but I hope that going forward, that what will come out of it is that, you know, these online spaces that we create to support our students now uh, will become kind of extensions of our, our brick and mortar classroom so that, you know, great, you know, um, you know, when you're teaching a face-to-face a, a -face class that's going really well, you know, the problem is often, you know, you're in the middle of this really great discussion and students are super excited and then the bell rings um, and then thinking stops and conversation stops and, and we have to move on tomorrow. That's not the case online, and we do often see that you know when the discussion is really rich, that students, you know, even students that have a lot of learning challenges and come from really disadvantaged backgrounds, will choose to come back um, and re-engage outside of school and extend that learning day, um, you know, with content that is is personally important to them. Very good. Well, thank you so much for your time again, Eric. Appreciate all the work you guys are doing there at Northwestern University, and thank you to our participants. Um, I will be sending out a link to this recording probably tomorrow to everyone who got registered. If you like this, this video and would like to see more professional learning like this, visit edleadersnetwork.org. And you are free to close the GoToWebinar control panel, and that will log you out of the session for this afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you.